to share screen. No, but it looks like it's recording now. It's recording now. Yep, that's okay. great. I don't, I, you can see that it's recording because I don't see that. Yes, I see it's recording. Yeah. Okay. The little There's a little, cloud, the, little, the little cloud icon with the. Oh, I see it now up at the top. All okay. right, usually it's down at the bottom for me. Okay. Okay. We, have, we, have, we have 30 attendees, 31, mm -hmm. all right. That's nice, Great. good. So I Me should too. start with my introduction, yes? Yeah. Uh, should we wait? Well, Chris, do you want to wait just um, a minute? Um, okay. Sometimes it takes a minute for people just to get into Zoom. Sure. So thanks, everyone. We'll, it's 6.33 on my computer. I'm not sure that's as accurate as anyone else's, but uh, we'll wait a minute or two, and then Chris Brestra, planning director, will give an introductory remark. OK. We have a lot of people here tonight. That's excellent. Now we have 41. So Pam, are you still there? I am. I was, I thought I was waiting for Nate to. Why don't we go ahead? I think Nate might be dealing with some family issue and then we can um, get started and um, he can join us, all right? Sounds and then when like he joins plan. back, then Pam can leave. All right, so. Um, the yeah. only thing that I won't be able to do is because Nate shared his screen, I won't be able to get to Karen and David's set of slides. So we might oh. have to wait. I'm, after I'm back. I'm back. Oh. It's fine. <laughs> I'm good. Good. Challenging, huh? We're good. We're good. <laughs> Nate, are you, are you staying now? Should I leave? Oh, Nate, yeah, yeah. No, I'm help? fine. I was always logged on. It's just, um, you know, my wife's at soccer practice and trying to get some other kids set up. So. Well, I, you can text me if you need me to come back, okay? Oh, no, thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm all set now. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, okay. Pam. Thank You're you. You're welcome. My pleasure. So I'm going to open the meeting now. Um, my name is Chris Brestrup, and I'm the planning director for the town of Amherst. And I want to welcome everyone to the fourth community housing forum, the Smart Growth Chapter 40R, right for Amherst. Based on Governor Baker's executive order suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, General Law Chapter 30A, Section 20, and signed Thursday, March 12, 2020, this public forum is being held virtually using the Zoom platform. Panelists, if technical difficulties arise, we may need to pause temporarily to address the problem and then continue the public forum. If you do have technical issues, please let Nate Malloy know as he is acting as host for this meeting. We will provide an opportunity for public comments and questions after the presentation by consultants Karen Sonnenberg and David Eisen. If you wish to make a comment during the public comment period, you must join the meeting via Zoom, via the Zoom link, teleconferencing link. This link can be entered into a search engine by typing it, and you can see it in blue on your screen right here. The link is also listed on the town website through the calendar listing for this public forum. Please indicate that you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when the public comments and questions are solicited. If you have joined the meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when fin finished speaking. Tonight we have with us Karen Sonnenberg of Karen Sonnenberg Consulting and David Eisen of Abacus Architects. We also have with us members of the planning board and members of the Municipal Housing Trust, and we may also have members of town council and other boards and committees in addition to residents. I think we have about um, 50 participants tonight. Wow. That's really good. Um, two members of the Housing Trust, John Hornick and Rob Crowner, have been involved in this project from the very beginning, working with consultants and town staff. I wanted to give you some background information on this project, both for the public, for whom this may be new, and also for the Planning Board and Housing Trust members who have been following this project more closely. 
In 2018, prompted by the Amherst Municipal Housing Trust, the town applied for and received a grant from the state entitled Planning for Housing Production. The goal of the grant was to investigate sites that might be appropriate for housing, for affordable housing, and to study the issue of Chapter 40R um, and whether it's, it's often called smart growth zoning and to determine if it's right for Amherst. So the town hired the consultants, Karen Sonnenberg and David Eisen, who helped us with our housing production plan in 2013. Karen is a planner and David is an architect. They've been working with us since the summer of 2018 on this project. So far, the town has held three public forums in 2019 on April 4th, June 4th, and December 19th. We heard about what is Chapter 40R, what is smart growth, why is the state promoting this type of development, and we heard about how this type of zoning might fit into Amherst. The consultants and staff rece received a lot of input at the public forums. Then at the request of the planning board, the consultants gave a presentation to the board on May 6th, 2020. The planning board wanted to have an opportunity to hear directly from the consultants and to talk to the consultants and among themselves about what was good and what wasn't good about the chapter 40R proposal. After the consultants presentation, there wasn't much time on May 6th for a planning board discussion. So the board decided to hold another meeting for that purpose, for the purpose of talking about what they had heard. The planning board invited members of the public to submit comments and some planning board members themselves also submitted written comments. These comments have been posted on the town website and circulated to the planning board members and to the consultants. The planning board held a robust discussion at its regular meeting on August 19th, 2020 about the chapter 40R proposal. Now we're embarking on our fourth and final public forum for the consultants to present the changes that they've made to this project based on the input and the comments that they've received. What's being discussed tonight is not a formal proposal as in a formal zoning amendment being presented to town council. It's an opportunity for the public as well as members of the planning board and housing trust to hear a final presentation to help us evaluate is chapter 40R right for Amherst? And do we wanna pursue the creation of a 40R overlay district? There are many arguments in favor of the 40R district. Amherst and the Commonwealth need more housing and this is a mechanism for providing more housing. A 40R district allows denser development of housing in already developed areas in exchange for providing affordable housing as, por as part of a 40R project. It also provides design standards and dimensional standards for the plan approval authority to use in reviewing any proposed project. We won't be making any decisions tonight, but I urge you to keep an open mind about chapter 40R. We may decide that it is right for downtown Amherst. We may decide that we like 40R, but it's better located in another part of town. This is a conversation that residents and members of boards and committees in Amherst need to have. If we decide that 40R is right for Amherst, then we need to focus on how to shape it to be exactly what Amherst wants. Some people are worried that this project is a fait accompli or something that's already been decided on, or that the process is happening too quickly and they haven't had a chance to participate. So there's still plenty of time for the town, the planning board and the public to consider this um, possibility, this proposal and to decide if it's right for Amherst. We need to decide, first of all, is it right? And secondly, where should it be located? The town may decide that the downtown is the right location, but that the current proposal needs to be per revised. Perhaps it shouldn't uh, take up the whole area that's proposed um, and a smaller area might be um, might be better, um, or the whole area might be uh, what we wanna go with. Dimensional requirements or design standards may need to be changed. The town may decide that another location such as East Amherst Village Center or Pomeroy Village Center is a better location. If the town decides to pursue a 40R, a zoning amendment would need to be developed and presented to town council. The town council would then refer it to the CRC, the Community Resources Committee, and the planning board for further study and to schedule a public hearing. Eventually, the town council would need to vote to adopt the plan and the state would need to approve the plan. There's a long way to go, but if residents of Amherst find that this type of development is appropriate and right for Amherst, the planning department and the planning board are available to work 
and continue to work in co coordination with the Housing Trust on this project. So now I'd like to introduce um, Karen Sonnenberg and David Eisen for their presentation. Uh, thanks, Chris. I'm going to uh, take a start at this presentation and we'll, David and I are planning to move through it um, as expeditiously as we can. So there's plenty of time for questions and comments. Hey, and thanks for your very thorough introduction, really provides a great background and context for what we're going to talk about tonight. And I also want to reiterate what uh, Chris emphasized, which is this project is a work in progress and the town will um, have to go through further deliberations um, to decide whether and if so, how um, 40 are, would work best uh, in Amherst and there will be uh, many opportunities for community uh, input during those uh, deliberations. Um, let's go to the next uh, slide. Yeah, hold on a minute. I get this. Uh, there you are. <clears throat> All right. Uh, this slide just summarizes some of the uh, uh, key components of the project work. Um, it talks a little bit about uh, how 40R has been an effective tool um, for promoting affordable housing and smart growth. Uh, certainly focusing development in areas that are considered suitable for more compact, denser development while protecting open space. Uh, importantly, uh, mandating uh, affordable housing uh, as part of new development, um, really promoting mixed-use development, um, and, uh, and integrally uh, design standards become uh, very essential given the by right uh, nature of the permitting um, that makes it easier for developers and property owners to uh, process applications given that all the applications have to comply with the 40R uh, requirements. Um, Chris went through some of what we've done, but we have held to date, and we'll go into some little bit more detail, three community meetings and early in the project, uh, cast a wide net to housing stakeholders to get input, not just on 40R, but also on other development opportunities that might become or be available in Amherst that could include some amount of affordable housing. Um, uh, it, it actually turned out that there, uh, there weren't that, that many uh, uh, suggestions of such great locations and the, uh, the project has really focused more on the uh, 40R piece. Um, and we did go through uh, a process of uh, getting input on potential 40R locations um, and um, went through, through a site analysis strategy. And we did some zoning analysis and some policy and procedural work and um, developed draft design standards and which we have revised based on uh, public comments. We also prepared a draft bylaw that has also been revised based on public content uh, comments. And these design standards and the bylaw will continue to be revised as the project moves uh, further along. Uh, you know, next, um, next, next slide. So briefly, what we're gonna go through tonight is um, just take a quick look at where 4 r is currently working. Um, talk a little bit more about the planning process um, we want to really focus on the comments that we have heard since the um, planning, initial planning board meeting um, and how we've responded and um, go through some key, the major components of the zoning bylaw and design standards. Next. So this map just shows the pockets of where uh, 40Rs are currently located in the yellow, you can see uh, they're in 42 communities. They include 49 districts. So some localities have 
more than one 40R district. Uh, it's projected that these districts uh, would create 19,000 units and almost 4,000 have either been built or are under construction. So it is working in, um, in other areas of the state. Next slide. And areas that are uh, adjacent to or nearby um, Amherst. Uh, East Amherst, I mean, East Hampton, for example, has a four yard district. And you can see in the map the areas in yellow. It is a fairly extensive uh, 40R. Uh, district and like most 40 yard districts, they're making incremental project, progress based on how projects uh, um, evolve. Um, they have 50 units that are completed, another 18 units that are approved, and then probably at uh, this point uh, nearing completion. Uh, next slide. Uh, Northampton also has been involved um, with 40R, and they, uh, in pretty early in the process, they identified the redevelopment of the former state hospital as where they wanted to focus um, their work um, and involved also kind of an incremental approach of uh, the first phase included work by the community builders. They started with a home ownership project and then moved on to a larger rental development. Uh, second phase involved mass development, which is a kind of quasi public state agency taking over the reins and, and, um, and guiding the development. I should also mention that another 40-yard district was created to um, involve only one project, a 30-unit uh, single-room occupancy project sponsored by the Valley CDC. The, town, the city actually decided that instead of going the Chapter 40B route, that it was more efficient to use 40R. They had a good working relationship with DHCD. They had been through uh, the process of establishing a 40R and, um, and so they decided to do, take that option instead of 40B. And in fact, numbers of 40R districts have in the state involved uh, a, a one project, although most of those projects are relatively large in size. Uh, next slide. So Christine uh, covered uh, some of this uh, work going back to um, the first community meeting that we held in um, April of last year was kind of an introduction to the whole issue of smart growth and 40R and this particular uh, project. Um, and we got in based on some small working groups, we asked folks for input on whether they thought 40R might actually be a good tool to use in Amherst and uh, got some initial feedback on um, what criteria the town should use in identifying a, um, a location for a 40R district. Um, on June 4th, we held a second community meeting to obtain input on uh, priority site selection criteria and locations. Um, and with that feedback um, and going through a, uh, a kind of ranking of criteria, we, uh, the downtown became um, kind of edged out the other uh, locations um, and was determined to be the place that the town should look to to start um, exploring actual bylaw for a 40-hour district. On um, December 19th, we held a third community meeting to review the locational decision and the selection process uh, to obtain further input on how 40-hour could work best in Amherst. And we got into some of the design standards. Um, as Chris mentioned, in May 6th, we presented a very preliminary 40-hour bylaw a draft to the planning board for comments, and we received a lot of comments. Um, we have sorted through those, um, and tonight, uh, which is the fourth community meeting, we are going to present um, uh, information on what we've heard and how we responded um, through uh, changes to the bylaw and design standards 
um, that will then be uh, held forth for greater scrutiny and deliberation by the town. Uh, next slide. So these questions represent those that came up most frequently uh, in the public comments following the planning board meeting. Uh, and the first one relates to just the fundamental question that we opened with early in the planning process was, does 40R make sense in Amherst? Uh, is this the appropriate tool, uh, zoning tool for, uh, for accomplishing some town goals? Uh, as we've uh, pointed out, it has worked in other communities and um, does bring meaningful advantages uh, to communities that have established these districts, such as uh, it brings financial incentives to the town from the state. It puts the town in a, a more competitive mode for obtaining uh, state discretionary funding, such as uh, Mass Works infrastructure grants, for example. Um, it has been a good mechanism for downtown revitalization as it guides development to appropriate locations where greater density and compact development makes sense, um, at, while simultaneously um, avoiding um, areas that with green fields and where the town or locality wants to protect uh, existing open space. And very importantly, um, it includes uh, an affordability requirement uh, 40R, at least 20% of the units um, must be um, affordable in the district uh, and homeowner in, um, throughout the district in projects. We have decided, like most of the communities in the state that have developed 40R, that at least 20% of the units in homeownership projects will be affordable, while 25% will be uh, required for rental units. And all that puts the town in the situation where all the units in the um, rental developments would count as affordable and, and for inclusion in the subsidized housing inventory. Um, and with any discussion of housing development in Amherst, the question of students comes up. Uh, can we prevent the new housing from being occupied by students? Uh, while 40R cannot uh, dictate uh, any exclusion uh, in the market units, based on state affordability requirements, um, affordable, the affordable units cannot be occupied uh, by students. Um, another number of comments uh, related to the current pandemic and why are we even contemplating zoning changes uh, given the market uncertainty. Um, and it should mention that uh, you know, changing zoning now will prepare the town um, for better guiding development um, when the market uh, does kind of rebound. Um, you know, planners, we like to say that the, actually the best times for planning is, are during downturns in the market um, so that uh, better strategies can be in place uh, when, um, things get back to some amount of normalcy. Uh, next slide. And, you know, the question of why the downtown when there are other locations that uh, where, you know, some development, uh, smart growth development in particular needs to be encouraged, like North Amherst, East Amherst, or Pomeroy Village. Um, we, through this site um, analysis strategy, determined that certainly all those North Amers, East Amers, Pomeroy, Pomeroy Village would all be good locations for establishing 40R. But in the analysis, the downtown edged out the other locations. In particular, um, given ongoing community concerns uh, in the downtown, in the fact that it lacked mandates for including affordable housing and concerns about a couple of new developments that many uh, residents felt 
uh, were inappropriate um, for the area, um, 40R would be a way of addressing those concerns because you have to include affordable housing and design standards are absolutely essential components um, to any of the zoning. So we really looked at uh, the downtown being, uh, a having the 40 are actually being a real opportunity for the downtown and also uh, promoting a number of smart growth principles that would make the area uh, more uh, vital. Um, Another question was, given the relatively high units per acre requirements under Chapter 40R, where could multifamily housing be developed in uh, the downtown? Um, and there are uh, minimum thresholds, density thresholds, given the type of housing that is uh, being proposed. Um, we certainly th believe that most of the uh, any development will be part of redevelopment efforts. Uh, David will go into it some length, but we've developed, we've uh, isolated uh, subdistrict one where there's greater density kind of in the town center area and a subdistrict two uh, works as kind of a buffer between the town center and low density residential areas. Uh, we expect that in the subdistrict one, development will occur in the redevelopment of existing underutilized properties, uh, mostly into mixed use um, properties with retail on the first floor and housing above. In Subdistrict 2, uh, with this limited to three floors, uh, we expect that uh, the development would be primarily residential. Uh, next slide. So David's going to take over on this one. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, it's been a very interesting process. And thank you for the questions and the comments. They have all been read quite a few times. And um, they really guided the um, work we've been doing uh, since the last community meeting and, and, and the previous two. Um, so, to continue addressing some of the concerns and questions that have come up, um, there's a lot of concern about retail, about restaurants, about vitality. There's a sense of sadness that beloved stores have closed. This was pre-COVID. Things are only tougher now. And there are no good answers for this. These, there are these uh, concerns everywhere about retail, about big box taking over. There is not much zoning can do uh, to affect this. You know, the current zoning, the 4DR zoning, uh, these issues will remain. So, um, you know, developers can subsidize retail. Um, the community can subsidize retail, different kinds of supports can be built in. This is definitely an issue of concern and that should be pursued, but I think in virtually always it's separate from the question of uh, whether you adopt 4DR. Um, parking is similar. Parking is a very big issue. Uh, to a point, there need to be requirements as associated with individual property owners and developers. There's been discussion about a parking garage. Um, there's on-street parking. To what extent do you, will a parking garage solve a lot of the problems, take the burdens off the on-street parking, take some of the burdens off of property owners so you have less asphalt more housing, more retail in stores. So this will continue to be thought about as the 4DR gets refined, but it will be thought about in relationship to bigger picture questions, which I think need to be um, looked at in parallel. And as Chris and Karen said, no decisions are gonna be made tonight or tomorrow night. This is gonna to continue to be evolve and this should continue to be a front burner issue, but I'm hoping won't interfere with some of the discussions of other issues that are um, very much a part of the 40-yard proposal. Open space, a huge issue. So we've made a pretty substantive change in 
the design guidelines. As written previously, they said that front facades of buildings needed to be spaced back a certain distance from the property line. That makes a lot of sense in a downtown where there's a consistent uh, setback of the property line from the curb where sidewalks don't, don't get wider and narrower. That has been changed so that there's a 15-foot setback from the curb. Uh, so on North Pleasant, on both sides of the street, You'd have building facade, 15 feet, in which you could have places for walking, landscaping, um, sidewalk dining, mailboxes, benches. Then you have the street, the same on the opposite side of the street. If buildings are set back too far, you lose some of that kind of vitality you get when there's a little bit of kind of compression, but that 15 feet from the curb will ensure that you have wide enough sidewalks that accommodate walking and other, other uses. In the residential districts, it's very different. In the design standards is the requirement that new buildings be set back the same distance as the properties on either side. So you, if you have big houses, little houses that are set back 25 feet, that setback will apply to new residential in um, the uh, residential zone subdistrict. And, and, and very shortly, we're gonna look at a map which will make this a little bit clearer. So we, we feel like these changes really will protect community character in terms of setback and open space. There are other kinds of open space. Um, we've required green space in parking lots. So you can't have endless swaths of asphalt. Um, and some of these can be larger so that they're playground areas. And this will depend on the particular kind of development. Um, but I think built in are the kinds of protections that we think are appropriate. Uh, next. So a uh, big issue was Cottage Street and other residential areas um, that were abut the 40R. So there have been changes in the sub-district design uh, standards, but also changes in the outlines of the sub-districts, which we think better protect uh, residential neighborhoods. So Cottage Street, earlier sub-district one allowed five-story buildings came very close to Cottage Street residential. That's no longer the case. That area, you could call it a down zoning, is now sub-district three, maximum three stories. Uh, we think that the new sub-district uh, design standards and outlines protect all the residential neighborhoods. Um, continue to look at this. Um, there are, if you live in the house uh, next door, you see this out your kitchen window, you'll have a different perspective. But we think there's been a lot of progress in this direction. Um, 40R threatened historic districts. Uh, there are no historic districts in the 40R proposed um, uh, overlay district. And because of the way we've set up the design standards and the sub-district um, uh, design standards and setbacks, we feel not only are the uh, historic districts, but historic areas that are not designated historic districts will be protected in an appropriate way. Uh, so again, this could continue to, to discuss this, but we, we, I think we've made refinements. Um, Five-story buildings, another hot button issue. So the existing um, downtown um, zoning allows five-story buildings. We are proposing in sub-district one that their five-story buildings continue to be allowed. But there's a big difference between the underlying um, sub, uh, um, zoning and the proposed 40R overlay in that there are design standards which require certain kinds of design elements. And one of the biggest questions about the 55-story uh, buildings, and it's not so much questions as criticisms, is uh, why are they allowed to be so overscaled? Why do you have a five-story wall that goes from the ground up to the top, that this seems oppressive in a pedestrian zone? 
So the design standards say that it needs to be a recognition through architectural detailing, through change in material, um, through change in, 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 you could call it articulation between the first floor and the floors above and between the second, third and fourth floor and the top floor. So this is the way traditional buildings have been defined for a couple of thousand years. We are not dictating the kinds of architectural character, but we feel like these design standards will prevent the design features that people like the least in the recent five-story buildings, and we'll tie them into uh, the buildings that tend to, people tend to like a lot more. Um, next. Why can't uh, design standards allow buildings like Newberry Street in Boston's Back Bay? Really good question. I'm on the Back Bay Architectural Commission, even though I live in Cambridge. I love the Back Bay. What makes the Back Bay so wonderful is that you have these broad flights of stairs, half a floor up to uh, stores, restaurants, and residential, and then half a flight down to restaurants and stores. So you're activating the street from two levels. What a great thing, except if in your wheelchair, what a horrible thing. So that vitality is a social good. Accessibility, ADA, MAAB, Mass Architectural Access Board requirements are considered a higher standards. So the Newberry Street buildings could not be built. So we've tried to set up design standards and a 40R that encourages vitality, but not by having steps that prohibit people from wheelchairs or strollers or crutches or any kind of uh, mobility issues from entering them. Um, 65 feet, really good question. Uh, lofty first floors are nice. Lofty second, third, and fourth, and fifth floors are nice. It does seem a little high, so we've lowered that to 60 feet, which allows a taller first floor in standard size, you know, 10 and a half feet for second, third, fourth, and fifth floors, and a pair put on top. This does not include uh, mechanical equipment, which is required to be set back from the street. So taller buildings, it's a whole floor of, 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 of building systems. Those cannot be visible from the street. There may be cases where it's impossible to hide them. A waiver might be requested. These are design standard requirements. Next. Um, so if I've gone on and on and on, it's only because they're serious questions and we're trying to give really serious answers. So these are the components of the bylaws. I'm not gonna read through these. These are uh, set up by the state in order to make sure that all issues are addressed in a thorough and a consistent way. And the very last one is, is uh, design standards. So next. So here's the new 40R district boundaries. And can I, is my mouse visible as it goes over this? Is, can that be transferred to me? If you, um... I did. If you, I think you could hit um, annotate if on the okay, on the screen, and okay. you could then draw on um, the screen. I think that will work. Annotate, yes. Uh, mouse, yes. Thank you for that reminder. Let's see uh, if it works. I, I, I haven't tried it before, but can you see that now? Because I have mouse. You can't see that. I can't see that. Okay. I see a black mouse, but it's not mine. If that's um, mine, I can always uh, just follow you. Okay, why, yeah. why, don't, why, why, don't I, why don't I talk through this? Okay, at the north, the north, uh, all the way north at the top. Okay, so subdistrict two, we, let me start at the beginning. We've gone from three subdistricts to two subdistricts. One is a town center in yellow, which is really the downtown areas and subdistrict two is residential neighborhood. Now it's, it's really abutting the smaller scale uh, neighborhoods where people live. We had a third subdistrict. It didn't seem to be working effectively. So north of Triangle, that is now subdistrict two, which is three stories with very different setback requirements that are based on uh, the abutting neighborhoods. 
So you don't, you're not going to have five-story buildings towering over Cottage Street. And the very north edge of that has pushed back a little bit. The outline has been pushed south to better protect Cottage Street and the residential properties there. Um, then below that, you have Subdistrict 1, which is overwhelming what you would call, overwhelming what you would call a downtown area where five-story seems appropriate, buffered by the three-story neighborhoods. In the southeast, that's been changed a little bit, so that it's subdistrict one only right along North Pleasant Street. And to the east of that, it's subdistrict two. It's closer to residences, it's closer to smaller scale, uh, non-residential as well. Across the street, remains subdistrict one. And again, this has been changed, 15 foot setback from the curb, not from, 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 from uh, you know, zero feet or five feet from the property line to the west and north of that is subdistrict three with those protections put into place in terms of height, uh, in terms of setbacks. And there's a requirement dropping down near the property lines with adjacent properties. So it drops down from three floors with some sort of element like a slope roof, like a dormer. So it comes pretty close to matching the uh, abutting properties. Excuse me, David, I just yep. wanted to interrupt for a minute. I wanted yep. to say two things. Um, I think you you referenced subdistrict three when you were um, looking at these green areas to the west. And I think you meant to say subdistrict two because we've dropped a third subdistrict. So that was one thing. The other thing I Thank wanted you. to do was to um, let the participants know that there will be time for questions and answers um, when the uh, presentation is over. I see that some people have raised their hands already. So we will certainly acknowledge those raised hands when the presentations are over and we can go back to any of these slides at that time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Chris. I, I, I apologize. I'm so used to being subdistrict three. One more correction on my screen. Karen Sunderberg is labeled David Eisen. I think everyone's figured out that there are two of us. We look a little bit different. Maybe that's <laughs> um, uh, that's what I'm seeing on my screen. So. Um, I'll try and accelerate this a little bit. I want to make sure there's time for questions. Uh, next. So I think I'll take over on this on this one. So we're just going to summarize the key sections of the bylaw um, and uh, want to emphasize that the state requirements under 4ER uh, state that the bylaw has to be all inclusive. Um, you cannot reference other uh, sections and standards in the existing zoning bylaw. Uh, it opens with a purpose, uh, a statement that says uh, that the 40 yard district will foster a range of housing opportunities, along with a mixed use development component to be proposed in a distinctive and attractive site development program that promotes compact design, preservation of open space and a variety of transportation options, including enhanced pedestrian access to employment and nearby services. Uh, it then goes on for a list of objectives, and I'm not going to read through the specific language on these objectives, but I do think that they're important uh, to recognize. I'm just going to kind of uh, skim over the important language um, on some of these, which is to incur encouraging a diversity of housing opportunities at a variety of costs, um, to uh, increase the supply and diversity of housing for households of variance, incomes, ages, and sizes, um, to ensure high quality site planning, architecture, and landscape design that is, con is consistent with the distinct visual and historic character of the downtown, as well as predictable, fair, and cost effective development review and permitting. Uh, to promote low impact green and sustainable development as well as pedestrian uh, friendly um, development 
and um, to allow context sensitive design and creative site planning in the reuse of existing buildings and then to, uh, to create positive tax revenue. Um, so the main focuses of the purposes. Uh, the, the bylaw also includes a list of definitions as well, basically most bylaws do. Um, it, uh, in the section three, the uh, physical boundaries of the zoning district uh, are referenced, uh, including uh, a reference to the to the zoning map. Um, in regard to section four, that uh, this section does emphasize the all-inclusive nature of the zoning, and also very importantly, uh, states that the provisions of the 4UR Smart Growth Overlay District uh, can be used or the developer and property owner can choose to use the underlying zoning. There's a choice and there is flexibility built into the zoning. Um, in regard to section five, there's, um, this section deals with permitted uses. Uh, residential projects uh, include multifamily and multifamily are talking about two family, three family or four plus uh, units, uh, mixed use development that includes uh, multifamily housing of two dwelling units or more, as well as parking and other accessory units. We kind of try to include a framework for further discussion of key issues that have come up in the comments that will involve, involve further deliberation and the uh, town will need to revisit uh, the non-residential uses that might be allowed or decide to rely solely on the underlying zoning. Uh, next slide. Um, ses uh, section six goes at length into the affordability requirements. And once again, um, we state the uh, thresholds based on uh, home ownership or um, a rental, as mentioned earlier. Um, section seven deals with the plan approval um, and provides um, that the planning board is the plan approval authority and that permitting will be done as of right. Um, section eight, goes through kind of the procedures involved in the plan approval process. Um, uh, I read through those pre-application concept plan, application um, submitted fees, uh, circulation to other re uh, boards for review and comment, public hearing and uh, peer review is allowed. Uh, next slide. And then on plan approval decision on uh, the focus of section nine, um, it states that plan disapproval, because this is by right permanent, is only allowed when the application is incomplete, does not meet zoning requirements, and it is not possible to adequate, adequately mitigate significant adverse project impacts on nearby properties by means of suitable conditions. Uh, the bylaw states that waivers are allowed but exclude they're not allowed uh, for uh, affordability requirements. I, I gotta say that um, we received uh, numbers of comments on waivers. Um, and this is another issue that the town will want to um, kind of continue to discuss and deliberate on what potential waiver uh, restrictions um, it might uh, decide to um, invoke as part of the bylaw and even excluding waivers. Um, one example of, for consideration is that the waivers could be limited to relatively minor features uh, that accommodate the specifics of a particular site or use, but don't set a precedent for similar waivers on uh, future proposals. Um, project phasing is also allowed uh, under section 10, um, involves changes in plans after the, um, uh, the uh, planning board approval and includes minor changes or major changes. Minor changes 
are allowed without need for another public hearing. I got to say, minor changes are just are not substantive. They're administrative, typically administrative changes. If there's anything that has a substantive bearing on the project, it has it's considered a major change and it's processed as a new application. Um, the next slide is David. Okay. And I think most of what is here, I'm not gonna go through this. People can read it up on the screen, but I think most of this we've gone through. So I wanna sort of translate this into really plain English and go back to the big picture, which is the point of all this fine print is to hold developers feet to the fire by making them meet design standards. And in exchange, we make it easier to do development and require affordable housing. So that's the point of all of this to fine print really matters, but this is a lot, a lot of these are about aspirations to get to that big picture. And then there are 25 pages of design standards, which are the execution, which people have read and I hope will read again and continue to give um, um, uh, comments. Next. And I think in mo most of this have been through uh, earlier in the presentation. Uh, next. So this is the kind of parking lot that would be required in a 40-yard district. I think this is really much more attractive than most of the parking lots that you have now. There's a lot more green space. It's better for pedestrians. These requirements are part of the trade-off um, uh, that, that go along with the 40-yard. Uh, next. This is a, a section through the street. You can see that 15 foot setback. You can see the trees. You can see on the ground floor, it's recessed. And it, it could be recessed, it could be pushed out to acknowledge entries. You can see at the top, it's stepped back. You can see bays. This is suggesting diagrammatically the kinds of features that are being required as part of the approval process. This is baked into the design standards. In a residential neighborhood, it would be in sub-district two, it would, this section would be substantially different. It would be set back, could be 20 feet from the property line. It would be three stories and the top floor would be set back. So this shape would be different, but very similar tools to require these kinds of features. So if you look at this section, and I think hopefully everybody understands this is a section uh, slice through the buildings on either side of the street, uh, showing the sidewalk. The recently built buildings do not conform to what's shown here. There's that straight wall up and down, top floor to the bottom. As you can see, those buildings don't conform. This is what's required for conformance. Uh, thank you for the moving hand. Uh, next. <laughs> Streetscape, what do you do with that 15 foot setback? There are a lot of options. Um, trees along the street, uh, feature paving up along the street, landscaping closer to the building, that's up at the top. The next one down, and if you have a store or a restaurant, you don't really want landscaping right up against the building because where do you put the outdoor tables? How do you look through the window of the store? So streetscaping right along the curb uh, so you get green, you require uh, the developers to provide this. So you want the 15 foot setback. It's nice to have some amenities to go along with that. Uh, next. So this is not a picture of what a facade would look like. I hope everybody understands this is a diagram. But it diagrams out where you have architectural features, where you have changes in the architecture, where you go from horizontal windows on the ground floor to make it look and feel residential, to more vertical windows up above to make it feel more residential. Uh, up at the top, between the fourth and fifth floors, there are changes. The exact kinds of changes are not prescribed because you really don't want a building that looks exactly like this. 
Uh, we want talented architects to have room to do really interesting things, but providing what the town is asking for and what we believe the town needs, which is a building scale to the neighborhood, which recognizes the historic fabric while recognizing uh, the realities of construction today. And all of the notes on the left and right pretty much say what I've just said. Um, they're all on file, you can read them. So um, that's, I think we're at the ends of the slides. I don't know if anyone wants to add anything on, on our team before we open things up for questions. Thank you for bearing with us. I wonder if um, the, two, um, the two residents of Amherst who were part of our working group want to say anything before we open it up to public comments and uh, questions? Mr. Hornick or Mr. Crowner? Yeah, I prepared something, Chris. Um, as chair of the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, I do appreciate the opportunity to comment on the proposals before us. First, I want to express my deep appreciation to both Karen and David for venturing into the minefield that is proposing zoning changes in Amherst. The task they have undertaken is not an easy one, and I admire the high level of research, thinking, and energy that they have brought to it. What you have seen is actually the third or fourth draft they have developed, responding each time to comments with both well-considered changes and good grace. They are committed to one more draft based upon your recommendations tonight before concluding really going above and beyond their contractual obligations. They have done the Amherst community a significant service, service in introducing many of us to the ideas and principles of smart growth, in developing a path that will allow us to take advantage of the state's 40R program, and in drafting a set of design standards to guide downtown development. I know that many of you have concerns about this, but I urge us all to figure out how to make this work. Let's not belabor whatever shortcomings in the process may have occurred, but rather focus on how best to improve on what has been presented. While critical comments are certainly welcome, let's also use this as an opportunity tonight to identify the changes that are necessary to allow this new approach to zoning, both downtown and elsewhere, to be successful in expanding access to affordable housing and reaching other objectives of the SMART Growth Program. Thank you, Chris. I just wanted to make sure that Mr. Crowner had the opportunity to say something if he wishes to. Thanks. Um, so what I um, find attractive about uh, 40R is that it helps us advance uh, three long-time planning objectives that the town has had. Uh, causing lower price units to be included when new housing is developed in the town center, adding form requirements to offset the size and massing concerns that are not addressed by the dimensional table, and creating transitional zoning that allows the edges of the town center to be redeveloped at a reasonable scale rather than serving as a, as a barrier. Um, so, thanks. It does it all in one step. Thank you. So Nate, do you want to recognize people or shall I recognize them and then you um, bring them into the conversation? Sure, I could, I could recognize them. I think, um, hi everyone, this is Nate Malloy. I'm a planner with the town. So it looks like there's about six hands raised. And so um, if people would like to speak, you can raise your hand as Chris mentioned earlier, or um, you could dial in and it, um, you know, the hands are raised in the order people raise them. So it just goes in chronological order and we'll, we'll call on people. Um, it might take a minute. We'll ask you to unmute yourselves and then you'll be able to speak. And, um, you know, this meeting is being recorded. So the presentation can be put online and then, you know, there'll be, there can be some, uh, the comments can be recorded and also, um, you know, the consultants and we'll have those. So, you know, I'm not sure if we have time to answer questions, but if we can, um, if there's something that can be quickly answered. We can try, but the you know the questions will be recorded as well. So all right. So can identify uh, themselves by their names and also their addresses before they speak. All right. All right, Barbara, you can um, unmute yourself and you're allowed to speak. Hi, 
Hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. It's yes. actually Celia Riahi, Barbara's wife. We live at 135 Cottage Street, and I have a number of questions. And um, this is all very new to me. So one on the diagram of the subdivisions, can you please specifically point out Cottage Street? I couldn't follow where that was. So yeah, was just, uh, everyone small. bears with me for a minute. Yeah, um, that one, it was too small, so I couldn't see. Oh yeah, you know, it's funny, I can't, I can't see what other people see. Um, In, uh, I have, I'm mousing it, but I don't know if people can see that. Sure. So this yeah. is, um, here's, here's, That's uh, Triangle Triangle. Street. That's if Triangle. you can see that, here's Triangle Street, and then here's yeah. Cottage Street uh, heading up north. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then I'd like to know really what affordable housing really means. What is the minimum and maximum rent? And how many years is it good for? Um, I'll take that on. Good questions. Um, based on the state requirements, affordable housing uh, means those who have incomes, um, uh, are, are, units are occupied by those who have incomes up to 80% of area median income, and that's adjusted annually by household size. It also means that there are deed restrictions that protect the affordability restrictions um, for a long period of time and more and more we're moving towards in perpetuity. Um, it means that the units have to be marketed uh, affirmatively so people outside kind of the normal um, avenues of getting uh, information are notified of the opportunity. Um, and it has to be, the units have to be uh, permanent and approved by um, uh, a subsidizing agency or uh, subsidized directly. Um, that, so this, all those requirements need to be met in order for the unit to be considered affordable under state um, requirements. Um, and where is the income, um, you know, chart? Uh, you know, off the top, the income limits vary by um, area and household size. And I'm trying to Let's see, I don't have them um, memorized. I would, uh, what, for a household of three, it's probably, um, uh, yeah, so this you is have the a, information, uh, 60, also, yeah, yeah, so, so 61, five for a household of three. Yep. Okay. Yep. And that changes every year? Every year, they're adjusted by HUD. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, would this, would the town of Amherst be the landlord? I guess I'm just not quite clear how all this works. Well, if it's a rental project, the property uh, developer would either be the, um, the manager or would they would assign, hire a property manager to manage the unit. If it's a but condominium. Who it? Not who manages it, who owns it? It would depend, if it's a rental project that's owned by typically the entity that develops it. And can they ever sell it to a private person? They can sell the, the property to uh, another entity, but the requirements of affordability and the requirements of the permitting continue with that uh, change of ownership. Okay, and last, last question, what would the ground floor be? Would it be stores or would it be apartments? Well, it, it's where this, the 40R is meant, uh, particularly in the town center, to promote mixed use development. So, on that kind of uh, major corridor, commercial corridor spine, you'd expect that the uh, first floors would be primarily retail, and the uh, store, stores, uh, stories above would be uh, residential. In the areas um, out, uh, outside of, uh, like in the subdist, the green areas, they would probably be mostly um, residential. Um, although along the main drag, drags, there could be um, some mixed use. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I'd like to clarify. Does just anybody to else want to chime in on that? Yeah. yeah. Your your um, second question, just to be clear. Yep. 
in the United States and certainly in Massachusetts, the public sector, the government, tends not to provide affordable housing except through housing authorities. Mm -hmm. We are not Sweden. We are not France. Right. Um, so what we do is we harness the power of the private sector with carrots and sticks. Okay. So 40R, the carrot is, well, carrots and sticks. We ease development, but we make them provide affordable housing. If there's 20% 20, 20 affordable housing, the other 80% 80, 80 who pay market rate essentially pay for that affordable housing and their systems of tax credits. But this is to get affordable housing out of the private sector because in Massachusetts, that's the only way we get it. Okay. So. Thank you. Yeah, good. All right, uh, Leonard, um, you can unmute yourself. change my husband's name to my name on the Zoom as I had wanted to. Um, so can you hear me? Am I hearable? Yes. yes. Can you? Okay. So I have uh, several questions and the first may be more directed at the planning board. I'm not sure it has to do with the vision for the future of Amherst. And I guess the question has to do with what we mean by smart growth. Is 1% population increase a year what's in mind? 10%, 25%, 2%? What is the demographic anticipation? And on what basis is that demographic anticip anticipation uh, presented? That is, I'm looking at a situation where I think we're going to see plummeting numbers of people connected with the university. That is remote learning, as we've seen from COVID, is going to become more and more the practice. We may even see residential uh, housing on campus having to be rethought. And I'm not talking just about students. I know there's a lot of concern about students and housing. I'm talking about everyone connected with the university, all kinds of staff, all kinds of professional staff and non-professional staff, faculty and non-faculty, people who, um, may no longer want to work in Amherst. And I don't know to what extent because of the pandemic, realistic expectations about population growth undergird this proposal and the sense of what lies ahead in the future. Um, I'm uneasy about empty places, about uh, Kendrick Place, in fact, perhaps becoming 50% vacant in the future. Uh, and so part of my concern has to do with the town planning and their vision. Um, and then what's related to that is, as you anticipate, if you do, let's say 10% population growth per year, whatever, on what basis, I don't know, but whatever basis you have, um, what kind of housing is really needed? What decisions or what thinking went into the conception of whether it's rentals, whether it's purchase, whether it's single family homes, whether it's apartments. And that also then brings me up, want to piggyback through a second set of questions having to do with affordability that I thought Barbara very effectively raised, but I have some additional questions. It's one thing to have a requirement as to the income of a person or students or part-time students or staff or whomever. Uh, it's another question to know what the actual price will be of purchasing and renting a place and whether that is a realistic figure for many people. And that has to do a lot, I would imagine, with the size of the unit. So my question concerns density. What is the understanding when 20% or 25% rentals versus ownership of property uh, is computed? Is that you know, one bedroom, five bedrooms, two bedrooms? And where are they located in terms of, I'm thinking now particularly of Subdistrict 2, which is closer to where I live, 66 Cottage Street, um, what is in mind? I would like to see more affordable housing in Amherst, much more. I'm not sure that I understand how that term is being specifically defined. 
relative to the specifics of the size of the apartment or the house and the pricing hints of the housing. So that's kind of the second question. And I suppose the um, third question that I have that I'm eager to hear response to has to do with uh, the, the question of major and minor with regard to revisions. How, how is minor defined? How is major defined? We were given a couple of examples, but are there broad definitions for what qualifies as minor and major and how the enforcement, the town enforcement kicks in with regard to uh, violations of the concept of minor and major when actually construction begins. So I, I mean, I have more questions, but obviously I've already deluged you with uh, set and I'm very eager to hear your responses to those three questions. I can answer the last question and maybe Nate and um, Karen can answer the other questions. Um, in terms of who enforces um, whether something is a major or minor change, the building commissioner is the zoning enforcement officer. So he takes first crack at deciding whether something is a major or minor change. And if it's a minor change in his mind, um, if it's very minor, then he usually, um, he's given uh, the ability to grant an administrative approval. Um, but if he has any doubt, he will send the case to the board, in this case, it would be the planning board, for their decision as to whether um, the change is major or minor. And if the planning board decides that it's a minor change, they may choose to approve it at a public meeting. If they decide that it's a major change, then they would um, have hold a public hearing. So it's a kind of a two-layered uh, decision process where the building commissioner is kind of the first line of defense. And he's, he takes a very conservative um, point of view, I must say. And then um, if he's not sure of, of his um, stance on the matter, then he would turn it over to the board to decide. Thank you. And this is no different at base zoning, 40R zoning. It's exactly the same thing, right? There's no mm -hmm. substantive change. In terms of the um, other questions that were asked, I, I feel like either Karen or Nate might be better able to answer those questions. Um, let me start with question number two. Mm -hmm. um, the state requirements on housing affordability are very prescriptive. So the formulas for calculating affordable purchase prices and affordable rents are detailed in um, state guidelines. Is in respect to unit sizes, the proportion of affordable units in a development would relate to the distribution of unit sizes in the project. So if there were, you know, half the units were two bedrooms and half the units were three bedrooms, then half the affordable units would have to be two bedrooms and half the affordable units would have to be three bedrooms. There's always that kind of a proportionate um, uh, kind of reflection in, in, in determining um, the number and the type uh, and the cost of um, affordable uh, units. Um, you know, uh, the town has done a significant amount of work um, on uh, doing market studies and housing needs assessment, et cetera. And there's a lot of information available about demographic projections um, et cetera. Uh, given the pandemic, um, I, you know, I would, Nate, uh, go on and, and, and give you some more feedback on your first question, but uh, I think we are entering into uh, somewhat un uncharted territory. We don't know how long it'll last or what the actual effects would be. I, I got to say, though, one of the things that we hear, we heard a lot when we were doing the housing production plan is that the university de uh, demand for housing in Amherst put such intensity, uh, uh, intense pressure on the existing housing stock uh, because the demand outstripped the supply that drove up housing prices. Um, maybe some people could look at this, uh, you know, the kind of maybe some fallout. I don't know, in fact, what the effects on the, uh, the market have been with the pandemic but some kind of fall off on the demand 
that might kind of um, uh, put less strain on driving up prices is not a bad thing right now. But I'll, I, I think the town folks are best to kind of speak to that issue. Yeah, I mean, hi, this is Nate. I'll just quickly in terms of, um, you know, the rental amount, you know, essentially the figure is that you can't pay more than 30% of your income uh, per month or 30% of your income for housing. And so, you know, there's some allowances for utilities, but, you know, essentially say like, so for a two person, if it's 55,000, you know, you can prorate that um, income per month and then 30% of that, you know, so there's a formula as Karen said, and so that's how the rents are determined. And then, so, you know, a two bedroom, could house two or three people. So there's a formula that is all prescribed. So it's not, right. um, you know, it's not, I think sometimes when people hear affordable, um, I think they think it's based on, you know, the, the landlord or someone comes up with the rent, but it's actually based on the income. And so it works backwards to come to, de de, you know, determine the rent. So it's derived that way. That's right. I think in terms of, you know, the, the population growth, I think you know, there's a few things. One is that a 40R overlay district is voluntary. So there's always underlying the base zoning. And so for an, the 40R uh, to be attractive to a developer, there has to be a balance of both, you know, maybe increased density, um, you know, it's, it's at by right, but there has to be some incentives um, and then, then they're required to have affordable units. So I think it's a balance of, you know, what is the under zoning, underlying zoning allow? And then what does a 40R uh, district allow? And I think it's a balance. I think there's a number of things that factor into what kind of size or density you allow in a 40R, um, you know, and then we even have differences in the sub district. So I think, you know, there's a number of factors in terms of what, what are the right sizes. Um, as Karen mentioned, there's been a number of studies. And so the 2015 comprehensive housing market study determined that whether or not there are students, there is a large market of people who would want to live in Amherst. So I think student demand does drive um, housing prices and vacancies, but there's also a lot of people who would probably want to live in Amherst if they had the opportunity. And so I think there's a whole market outside of the university and colleges who would be willing to move to Amherst if more housing was available. And so, you know, they had figures on that plan, but, um, you know, your point is well taken that there could be some shifts in some of the factors driving housing, but I still think that Amherst is a community where we'd want to encourage different families, different housing types, more people to move in. So, you know, there's been a loss of school aged children and families. And so, you know, allowing certain um, multifamily developments in downtown could open up other neighborhoods in town. So, you know, I think there's a whole market that would be willing to move to Amherst if it's available, um, if housing's available. I don't, you know, we haven't talked specifically about, you know, certain percentage growths, but I think that is a good question. Um, you know, what, for instance, you know, what is, you know, is there a carrying capacity or, or a, an overall growth rate that we're looking for? And I'd like to add a clarification to this. Because all of this is private development, the developer will have to determine whether it's rental, uh, uh, whether it's for sale. The town doesn't do that. And no, the concern was raised, could uh, something be built and remain half empty for years? No bank is going to loan a developer money and no developer is going to develop a property unless he's pretty darn sure that he can make money off of it. This is the way our system works. So the bottom could fall out of the market. It could be built and remain empty, but it's, 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 it's very unlikely that that would happen um, because of market forces. So every developer is doing their own market set study, very independent from what the town might be doing. Yeah, my thought would be if, if you know, the market, right, if the market, uh, you know, um, isn't doing very well, then the rents decrease. So, you know, there's some give and take about how they would fill the units. So, right. The other thing we're hearing lately is that people are moving to this area from the uh, urban areas along the coast, um, you know, and that is really driven by this um, pandemic. People are interested in moving to um, Amherst and other areas in Western Massachusetts and places that are not, you know, in the in the thick of things. And so that's actually driving up, um, particularly sales in Amherst of of homes. But I imagine it would also drive up um, the the desire to rent in Amherst as well. 
All right, there's, there's 16 hands raised, so I just wanna make sure we have enough time for everyone. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next uh, participant. Thanks for those questions. All right, Jennifer, you, uh, you can unmute yourself. Yes, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, I'm yes. Jennifer Talb at 259 Lincoln Avenue. I'll be really quick. Um, this is just my personal opinion, but I would just put it out there that I, I have, um, I'm not comfortable with the five-story recommendation. I just think no matter what the design standard that five stories is out of scale. I would prefer three, like the um, development on University Avenue, um, kind of across from the bike shop. Um, but I would feel comfortable with five. I know, you know, that there has to be some, I mean, I'd be comfortable with four, uh, realizing there has to be some compromise, but it would just be my suggestion. I don't know how, you know, again, the general community feeling is, but um, I would much feel much more comfortable with a four story than a five story limit. So that's all I have to say. Thanks. <laughs> right. uh, Hilda, you can speak. Yes, I have three comments that I want to make. One is I pick up out of the Boston Globe, which I read quite regularly over many years, and that has to do with with the sunshine and shadows, particularly in Boston, it's shadows on the common. But here, I look at very narrow streets, like Prey Street and Triangle Street, and now with only that one building on the corner of Triangle, and uh, I guess that's East Pleasant now, that street is in the dark a good part of the winter. And if I owned the land on the north side of Triangle and my building was in the dark most of the winter, I would be very unhappy because the value of my property would be vastly decreased. And so I, that's one thing that I, I've been rather pushing for the zoning bylaw for, that we ought to think about is shadows of buildings on other people's properties. And do we really want that area of, of, of the north end of town with buildings so high, this goes along with Johnny, that, that the sun is blocked from the buildings across the street. I know now my son has an office on Halleck Street and a good part of the winter, it's in the shade when the sun is low in the sky from one East Pleasant Street. So that's, that's something that really has to be looked into how these buildings are designed with narrow streets, how you're going to provide sunshine to the abutting properties that they're not in shade. That's one, one issue with the design. The other thing is more practical, I guess, in order to pull this off, what's going to happen to the current small businesses that are in these buildings while the transition takes shape? Even if it's done one property at a time, we're going to lose a lot of lot more small businesses, I think, with no place to move to in town while the construction takes place. And then will they be able to afford the rents to go back there once the expense of the new building raises the rents a lot higher? And then the third issue is also a fiscal issue is just looking at the, the properties that have the required affordable housing in it, the paperwork and the expense of the paperwork is really onerous. And just keeping up with all the paperwork that's involved with the affordable tenants, sort of gonna make management expenses very, very high for most of us local landlords. I don't know how how that can be adjudicated, that we can afford to build the buildings. The rents will seem to have to be a lot higher on the non-affordable units, which will push all the rents in town higher as the current buildings have already done. In other words, the new buildings come in and set a standard of $1,900 for a studio makes a you know, six, $700 studio look really cheap. And that means that that studio can get pushed up to a thousand bucks. I mean, I'm just giving a, for instances, but I mean, this is what happens that the, the new buildings raise the rent on everybody. 
And so these are things that people have to think about and, and how you're going to deal with them. That's the end of my speech. Thank you, Hilda. I will, um, Meg, or uh, sorry, uh, I'll say Pam, if you can speak. Hello, Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Thanks for uh, listening to us. Um, I wanted to comment and thank the, um, the consultants for the hard work of actually taking the time finally to look at the context of what was being recommended and, and really starting to sort of put themselves in the, in the place. The concerns that were raised previously had everything to do with the look and the feel that was being suggested. Um, I think looking at caps of three-story buildings against all of the outlying neighborhoods is a good start toward a conversation. I think um, one of the concerns I have and somebody perhaps can tell us in a little more detail if by right uh, construction or, or a, a proposal is being made for whether it's uh, subdistrict one sort of the town center or in the currently the limited business districts what you're calling subdistricts two. I understand that the planning board would be the sort of the reviewer by right, they would be allowed to build the three-story buildings. Um, it, it's very difficult, as you said at the very beginning, it's very difficult to dictate design. Um, so how would the planning board be able to, uh, what, what leverage would they have on a, the look and feel of a building in the context of a neighborhood? Um, that's sort of the gist of it. You know, what, what, they're not the design review board. I, I understood from reading the, the draft proposal that there, in fact, is no design review board uh, involved in this process if it were to be uh, accepted. Um, so, again, it's, it's, it's how does the, how does the planning board enforce the, the 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 correct look and feel because you said one of the objectives was to guarantee a high quality landscape and a high quality archi architecture. So how does that happen? Thank you. That's really a question for David and um, and Karen, I think, because I haven't had any experience in this type of development. Well, there, fundamentally, the planning board reviews the application to ensure compliance with the, with the 40R zoning. So in compliance with the design standards and the other uh, requirements of the, of the zoning. And there's some, there inevitably, there are some uh, subjectivity um, involved in this and some judgment. So different people have different interpretations of what they would like to see built. So I think the word insured was used. It's tough to ensure that any particular person is happy with the results that come out of this. Um, the design standards can't guarantee fantastic architecture that you like. What they can guarantee is that you don't have a five-story building facade that goes unchanged from the ground up to the sky. So you're asking really good questions to which um, there aren't definitive answers other than we try and tighten this up as much as possible. So it would be possible to meet the, the letter of the bylaw, but not necessarily the intent. Um, I don't, mm. 
depends what you define as intent. If somebody's interpretation thought, I, of the intent is that the new building looks almost exactly like one of the older buildings, then that's probably the case. If the intent is that their proportion, scale, material, recognition of the ground floor, um, setbacks from the curb, those can really be guaranteed. Those are built in, those are baked in. Things that can be described in numbers can be absolutely guaranteed. Um, other issues are more subjective. The change, you know, it might be no, it noted in change in architectural detailing. It doesn't prescribe exactly the kind of detailing. So I think it's hard to escape from the intent. The intent is laid out. The intent is in the design guidelines and then there's specific requirements. So what we try to do is navigate between the qualitative requirements um, uh, that, 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 that we start out with in the very specific requirements uh, in the details. I don't know if this is helping to answer the question because it's such a good question that anyone who writes design standards spends a lot of time agonizing over, whether they're sitting at their own computers, whether they're sitting with their partner, or whether they're talking at a meeting. Thank you. All right, uh, Michael, you can speak. If you unmute yourself. Can I be heard now? Yeah. Okay, this is Michael Greenbaum. I live uh, at 10 Chadwick Court in Echo Hill. I have several questions which I think are not really disguising what they really are, which is concerns. So one of my major concerns is that downtown Amherst, the town center, unlike any of the other districts that you might have considered, I think belongs to the whole town. It is a place that is meant to serve the whole town. And therefore, I'm very concerned about treating it as though it were another district. And 40-hour zoning uh, that I might be very happy about elsewhere I'm not very happy about downtown because I think the more housing we build downtown, even affordable housing, and I very much regret this puts me sort of opposed to John and the Municipal Housing Trust. The more housing we build downtown and the more parking is associated with that housing, the less desirable downtown will be for the rest of Amherst. And many years ago, I was part of the Town Commercial Relationships Committee in the early 90s. And, and our concern there was primarily to try to improve the commercial environment for small businesses downtown. In some ways, increasing housing stock downtown might seem to do that. But in other ways, I suspect it's going to drive away more customers from downtown businesses than it, in Atlas. So that, that is one kind of concern. Um, Another concern may be slightly more cynical. And that is, we heard in Amherst about developing an urban corridor along North Clinton Street long before 40R districts were in the news or long before there seemed to be a trade-off between uh, big buildings downtown and affordable housing. So I think there is a natural impetus among developers and builders to have those five-story buildings, which I don't want at all. Uh, I don't want them in the sub one district or the sub two district. And I, I think that there is a sense of unease throughout the town, that this is being driven by the needs of developers and builders to increase their income rather than to try to build in accordance with the character of the town. So that's one great concern that the, the proposal does talk about the character of the town, but it makes no suggestion as to how its proposal is in keeping with the character of the town. And I think a, a low rise downtown is in keeping with the character of the town. 
Uh, my last concern has already been uh, raised, and that is making the approval by right. I mean, I, I was, I'm not in love with the zoning bylaw, haven't been for a long time, but at least it made the process of appeal uh, for special permits and appeal from disagreements of by right, or what counts as by right, which made it clear. As, as uh, David said, uh, there's a lot of subjectivity here and I'm ordinarily in favor of that, but I am now very much concerned that uh, we have not put enough safeguards in to preserve the character of the town. Well, I certainly realize the rights of builders to build on their property. The last question I have is a point of clarification about the design uh, standards and its relationship to the whole 40R district. I have found nowhere, going back to the 70s Scoggs report, where people who talk about density talk about how dense is appropriate. And I see nothing in this uh, 40R district proposal until we get down to the design standards, which talks about the height of buildings. So I gather that the height and density issues are matters of design standards. And what I want to know is, can design standards be changed if the town were to accept a 40R district downtown? Thank you. Can I address this last question? 40R does have minimum density requirements based on uh, the type of housing. If you're looking at multifamily, if you're looking at single family housing, it's eight units per acre. Townhouses, it's 12 units per acre. In multifamily housing, it's 20 units per acre. So um, that, that does shape um, some of the design issues, but that's fundamental uh, to um, 40R requirements. Um, I see. But that doesn't talk about the height, does it? The density standards don't, uh, requirements under 40R don't have any height requirements, but you've got to kind of project how you can get to the 20 units per acre. And, um, and it should be mentioned that existing zoning under the, uh, the general business is five stories currently. Well, I know, and that's another story, but. Uh, yeah. Let me just say something. So the minimum density uh, says it can't be too small and the height requirements or height limitations say it can't be too big. So it sets a top and a bottom. And I think all of the, your questions are really good questions. Um, they, we do believe this is an improvement over the existing zoning. Whether it's perfect in every way, uh, we continue to be discussed, can we improve it? Uh, that should continue to be discussed. But we think it's a big, big improvement over the current zoning and provides more protection than you now have. Thank you. Jean. Good evening. I'm Jeannie Hardy. I live at 116 East Pleasant in Amherst. First of all, I want to just thank the architects because I, I really do feel that you listened to the community input and you made changes um, in your design that I, I think a lot of people really care about. So thank you very much for that. I have three uh, questions and comments that I'd like to make. I haven't heard any time during these discussions about requiring underground parking. So one thing that would really make the downtown better and more work walkable is if there were a requirement for all these new buildings to have underground parking instead of, you showed us a picture of a parking lot where it looks like, you know, it wasn't very dense. It was pretty because it had trees, but it's still a parking lot in the middle of downtown. So I'm concerned about adding new construction, especially new high density construction without adequate parking. My concern is 
about whether the town should have to pay for a new garage so that developers can make money from high density, uh, high density units, why can't the 40R laws or bylaws, I guess, um, require the construction of underground parking sufficient for all the units in the development? My second question is, so we heard that in perpetuity, rental properties that are uh, designated for lower incomes will be preserved. But if a low income person buys a property, are they then not able to sell it at market value? How does it work for purchases? That's my second question. My third question is sort of fundamental. Um, there's been so much so you told us that 40 R districts have worked well in other parts of Western Massachusetts and you gave examples of Northampton and East Hampton. In both of those cases, they identified regions that really needed re revitalization. You showed us a picture of an old abandoned mill and you talked about an old abandoned hospital. And so those were used as 40 R's. We're talking about taking the most vibrant core center of Amherst, which is the this part that people identify with as the heart and soul of Amherst and making it easier to make large buildings in the middle of town. And I just continue to wonder, I know you said in your presentation that many zones like Pomeroy and East Amherst were considered. I just am wondering how come even given all this public comment, we haven't we're still talking about downtown as the 40 R district. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to tackle a couple of the questions. Um, one is on the issue of in perpetuity. Um, home ownership developments uh, units um, have deed restrictions and they are often now in perpetuity too, which means that when the property turns over, the affordability restrictions remain with the property. The resale price is indexed to changes in area median income. And so they are remain as affordable as time goes by. So people cannot put their affordable units on the open market. The market value is actually determined by the formula for the resale price included in the deed rider. Um, the other issue regarding uh, the example of an already built area, actually a lot of the 40 R's, I, we use the example of the nearby communities, um, but a lot of the 40 R's are based in areas that uh, do have uh, compact development, often near transit, uh, in main areas where values are high, um, where mixed use makes sense. And uh, so there are plenty of examples, uh, probably even more examples of those types of projects um, than the others. And I can touch on a, a couple of the other points. I mean, in one, uh, this is a minor issue. What we are proposing isn't so much a design, it's really design standards, but, but, but I appreciate your comments on it. So it's a tough balancing act. Um, if we required, if the town required developers to provide underground parking, it's reasonably likely that they would say, the only way I can afford to do that is if I can develop six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 stories. I'm already providing the affordable housing. I'm already having to raise the rent or the purchase price on the market rate housing, and that's been commented on. If you make me provide underground parking, I'm going to have to raise the rent or the sale price even higher unless you can give me seven or eight stories. And I, I can't say exactly what these numbers are, but that's what you're likely to hear. There's only so much you can get out of developers. So if you want the affordable housing, they're going to have to be trade-offs. Now, if there's no place to park, that's a big problem. But it's conceivable that part of the town's obligation is not to provide affordable housing, but to provide parking with a parking garage so that the developers can provide affordable housing. These are really complex equations. Some are financial, 
and some are the quality and character of urban life. Um, how do you how do you get the best of all of them? And this is what we're trying really hard to do. And your uh, concerns are appreciated. And I hope there's the understanding that we need to find that balance um, recommended to you, and that the town needs to find the right balance between all these competing concerns. So I'd like to give a practical response to the question of why are we still talking about 40R in the downtown? I think that many of us do think that there is um, reason to think that a 40R in the downtown might be a good idea. But um, the, the, the consultants were hired by the town for a certain limited amount of money. And I think they've already gone beyond the amount of money that they were hired for. Um, so we would need to hire another set of consultants or perhaps the same consultants to look at the possibility of a 40R in East Amherst Village Center or Pomeroy Village Center, which we may choose to do. But for this particular project, um, for now, we're focused on the downtown. This is the last public forum. After this night, the, develop, or the consultants will write up um, what they've learned and give us a final product. And then the town can choose to determine whether we really want to pursue a 40R in the downtown or whether we want to um, switch gears and pursue one elsewhere. But there isn't enough money left in the consultant's um, contract to uh, ask them to do that for us at this time. And let me throw out a, a, another way to look at this question. There are parts of downtown that are really quite wonderful. But as you move further north, there's areas that are pretty big swaths of asphalt, surface parking, um, one-story retail, and, and there's nothing, yeah, they, I think the cursor's moving around in that area. And I want to be respectful to the property owners and the people whose stores are there, but it's conceivable that redeveloping that um, with parking in back, with stores and restaurants up against the street, and housing up above would create a significantly better downtown. That's, that's the entire point. Um, that's our, so that is why we have been recommending the consideration of a downtown um, uh, 40R. All right, um, looks like Dorothy, you can um, unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. I'm um, Dorothy Pam, 229 Amity Street, and I live in a major historic district in the town of Amherst, right, that goes right up to this area. And I'm speaking as a private citizen. Um, the need for affordable housing is strong, but we do not need to do 40R to get affordable housing. The town just has to make a decision that they'll change the zoning and inclusionary zoning, which has been suggested by many boards and committees to um, perhaps not 20 to 25 percent, but say to 10 percent. And if we'd had that in effect for all of the new construction in the past several years, we would have many new units of affordable housing. So um, we don't need to do 40R in order. It is not the only way to get affordable housing. I do appreciate the response to the many comments about setback. Uh, I think that's important and very major. But I did not see the design of the, that last design on page is it 17 perhaps. I did not see much difference in that design from a, um, a warehouse or a um, hospital. Um, the setbacks are not very big. There's almost no ornamentation. There's a small variation in windows, but it does not relate to the wonderful buildings that are on Main and South Pleasant around the town green, which, uh, are serviceable and look good and make you want to go there. Uh, the other aspect of the mixed use buildings is the w buildings that I've seen built under that so far in Amherst, they're not inviting the main floor businesses, whatever they are, they have no personality. We just see a big plate glass window. There's nothing that says, oh, go in there. This is an interesting, unique place. So I'm not really sure if that does increase our commerce. Um, I, I'm talking about who is coming to Amherst. I think that there's a big movement going on of people, family, wanting to come to uh, Western Massachusetts from some of the more densely populated areas. 
And I do agree, I think we're going to see a major restructuring of how the university uh, uses its dorms and how many people are on campus and still employed. But families, I think, are very eager to come to Amherst to small, well-run, well-regarded school district. And we know that there's a great shortage of housing for them. So if you're going to have housings for family uh, in your buildings, affordable or, or, or market rate, where is the green space? Where is the private green space and a shared green space for the people who live in the apartment buildings? The only green space is for the shoppers. So I, I don't see those as really being homes or, or residences for people who main that who, for whom that would be the main place that they, they would live. Um, so um, I, I also I'm very, I guess I'd heard it before, but I'm upset to hear that the design review board would not be part of this project. I think that um, requires us to trust too much and gives away too much power. And uh, as the um, consultants have said, there's a lot of subjectivity in what is or is not um, a design that fits. Um, and I think the design review board really is an important role in that. Uh, otherwise, we, the people of Amherst, we don't own that land, it's private property. And we, we do understand that, but it is in the heart of our downtown. We lose too, too much, too, 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 too big a part of having any kind of say in what would be there. And it'll be by right, and that's what it is. I also agree that three stories is a better height. With the fourth is a possibility. I mean, you talked about incentives. Um, so that the area where you have something it, to play with could be the fourth story but not the fifth or the sixth story. I do agree totally with Hilda that sunshine and light are key. A place is not inviting if it's in the shadows. We've already lost a lot of sunshine downtown. When you come down from the north, all of a sudden you see that the downtown is shaded with just the new buildings that exist now. So I, I think we have to really be concerned about it and not go into the 40 yard downtown at this time. Um, I do think in a different place, East Amherst, perhaps, where there's more land and it would, uh, there's more possibility to play with this concept. But for downtown development, um, I would say townhouses would be much better than apartment houses at this time. Thank you. It, it just two clarifications. Um, the what is shown in the um, design, the graphic design standards, those are by no means designs. They're very much diagrams. So I hope people aren't looking at them and thinking that is exactly what we're telling people to build. Um, these are setting design uh, parameters for developers, architects to embellish. And the second point is, um, in the design standards, there are requirements for open space associated with buildings. So you can't have parking lots going right up to the face of the buildings. And I showed a diagram of little bits of green space in the parking lot, but there are also requirements for larger green space areas associated with buildings. Um, and in most places, they would be certainly in subdistrict one, they would not be along the street, they would be behind the buildings. And if you look at, we had some earlier diagrams that suggested where these could go. So we think we built in a reasonable amount of green space in a variety of different areas. And again, this is in the details of the design standards as written. And I encourage you to look at them to see if they address the issues you're raising or not. And, and, and if you don't think so, continue to let us know. All right, thanks. There's still uh, 10 hands uh, raised, so we'll, it's about 8.30, but um, as uh, Elizabeth, you can speak, and I hope we can you know, get through everyone. Uh, yes. Are you getting the horrible echo I am? Yeah, do you have, do you have your phone on or nearby? Um, sometimes that's the cause of it. Uh, no. I'm not sure. Do 
you want to uh, try try again? What the options are. Oh, you could make a phone call. And one of us could, um, and, and I think that would get through to us. And do we have the phone number for this meeting, Nate? I don't know if we have the phone number. We'd have to go back to the. Um, yeah, we just had the, we just had the link. Um, Let me see if I can find the phone number. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could try one more time. I'm not sure why um, why there's an echo. Sometimes, it's, you know, if you have another device near the computer, whether or not it's on or not, that can cause an echo. Um, How about now? Uh, still, still, still an echo. echo. Would you mind? Um, well, can we can we take um, the next attendee and we'll get back to you, Elizabeth? Right. I can't find a phone number. I I cannot do that. Uh, Jean, you can unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, my name is Jean Janecki. I'm I rent a home on 33 Memorial Drive. I highly agree with uh, Michael, Jean, and Dorothy's concerns. Um, so I assume that all downtown buildings will be demolished, and these multi-story buildings will replace them. Um, I did not attend the other meetings. Um, it seems <laughs> such a shame. And of course, you're creating a whole new town, and the Amherst Charm will be destroyed. These, the new buildings that are there now that were put up recently are so unattractive. Um, and I <laughs> would hope that the other buildings, these new buildings would be more attractive than those. It really is not inviting. Those new buildings, as others have said, are not inviting at all. Um, it doesn't seem that, that there are any plans drawn for other parts of Amherst that were cons perhaps considered so that we can compare to see what that would look like. If that would be more appealing than putting these buildings in, in the town, in the center of town. There's, we have nothing to really compare to. Um, even though you've talked about that, no, it's not a done deal. It pretty much seems like a done deal that centers, you know, the center of town is in the only place. So what would keep Amherst, you know, have Amherst keep its unique and picturesque town feel if all these buildings look the same as maybe in all of the other developments that they've talked about for the 40 hours? I mean, I'm very supportive of affordable housing, but I do feel that it would be better in another part of town. Um, you said that there are, you know, successful 40 hour developments in downtown areas. Um, but again, it seems like we already have maybe not as vibrant downtown as we need, but there might be other ways to make our keep our make or keep our downtown vibrant than putting in these type of developments that I think would, in my opinion, at least, and in others, um, it seems would be better off in another part of, of Amherst. Um, and just, you know, another question that was already asked, but not really answered. And I don't, perhaps you don't know, but right, how affordable would the, you know, the business and the store and the restaurant sections of these buildings uh, really be, especially for those um, businesses that are forced out because of their original sites being destroyed. Thank you. I mean, I'd like to respond quickly. I think we want to run a quick response is um, the 40 R I don't believe will unleash a wave of development that wouldn't have happened anyway. Um, the only difference is the major difference is with 40 R there are design guidelines that you don't, don't currently have. So I do believe this is the intention that 40R gives you more protections rather than less. Developers right now can tear down half or all of downtown uh, if they own the property and do five-story buildings like the ones you don't particularly like. 
I think we give you more control over that. That, that That's certainly the intention, not to lead to the result that you're describing. And I think it, 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 the 40-yard the de deserves real scrutiny to try and anticipate what will happen and make sure uh, what you don't want doesn't. Yeah, thanks, David. I just want to say quickly, um, for Elizabeth, for the call in number, you could dial 312-626-6799, and you'd be prompted for a webinar ID, and it is the 885-625-06992 on the screen. So if, um, you know, that may work. I see you have your hand raised. I'm gonna allow you to speak, Elizabeth, and see if, if we, we've figured out the echo. I think I fixed the problem. Awesome, yes, it yeah. just sounds like it's gone. Yes, uh, yes, this is Elizabeth Veerling, and I live at 36 Cottage Street. And I just wanted to say again that I really appreciate Christine's uh, introduction to the project. And I do uh, appreciate also the consultants having altered some of the design standards. However, I still think that they don't really go far enough to protect the character of our town. Um, so I had a number of questions, but I think probably the most important, given the, the time frame that we're at right now, is um, my understanding, or perhaps you could clarify for me, is that the 40R overlay, which would now, part of it is overlaying the general business district, as what, what I understand is that the developer could choose either 40R or the current zoning um, standards. And since, as was mentioned, the current zoning standards have given us these charming five-story buildings, um, what it seems to me that there's really no reason that the developer is going to choose 40R uh, instead of the zoning standards that exist. So it seems to me that the first thing that has to happen is the general business district zoning standards need to change. Um, otherwise, 40R will have no impact in the general business district. Um, I also wanted, to, so that's sort of a question comment. I don't know exactly what. Um, so, so along with that, then it seems as if 40R is really targeted to the limited business districts. That's where it does become a carrot for the developers because the developers right now are very restricted in those limited business districts. So, um, so that's uh, one thing that I guess I would like to have commented on. Uh, my second concern goes along with the comments that have been made about the narrowness of our streets. Um, and this is particularly to be noted at Triangle Street and it's something that I think needs to be thought of um, overall in the town. But for example, one concern or one thing that goes along with smart growth is transportation. Um, Triangle Street is completely uh, inappropriate for bicycles, for example. There's a little white line on the road. Um, it's 12 inches from a, from a uh, curb. It's not a bike lane. Um, Triangle Street is extremely narrow, so putting any kind of tall buildings there is a real problem. Um, so I think, again, given the Time that we're talking about. Uh, I guess I would just like some comments on those issues that I've raised. Yeah, I mean, I think this is Nate. I'll just say quickly that, um, right, so 40R is a voluntary overlay that a developer could use. And so I think your assessment of, you know, where it is most incentivized is the limited business zoning. And I think um, you know, to the comments by Dorothy Pam about, you know, there could be other zoning measures that could work. I think what's great about having this, these forums and this 40-hour discussion is, you know, helping Amherst decide what is right for downtown. So is it adopting a 40-hour or is it adapting pieces of 40-hour uh, and other zoning measures? So, um, you know, I think that's a really good point. I, I think that, uh, you know, the 40R in the subdistrict one, which is over the BG, may not have enough incentives to entice a developer. And that's something that would need to be discussed more. Um, 
you know, moving on to the narrowness of streets, the one thing that the design standards have is a 15 foot curb to building front um, dimensional standard, which isn't in zoning. So I think, and that could be examined, it could be made, you know, wider on some streets, but, you know, currently we allow a zero setback to the property line. So if the property line is five feet from the curb, you could get a building that's five feet from the curb, but the 15 feet, you know, is um, independent of property line. It's really from the edge of the curb, you know, the street to the building. And so, you know, it's a different way to measure setback. And yeah, I, I think, right I, I, I guess I understand that, um, which is what I, why I'm pointing out the fact that putting overlaying 40R on the general business district gets us nowhere. So um, just for general, the general public to understand that, that, um, and also, I mean, I've taken a tape measure out into central Amherst and 15 feet is not a lot. I mean, I have 15 feet between my property line and my neighbor's property line, and it is not a lot. Um, it's not really a, a, a distance that allows a sidewalk. And um, we've seen how great it would be if we had space for outdoor dining that we've experienced now with COVID, 15 feet does not allow that with a sidewalk and any kind of other uh, landscaping. So um, I just wanted to bring up that, yes, maybe that's better than what we have, but I personally don't think it's good enough. All right. Thanks. Uh, I'm gonna, yeah, we still have a number of hands raised. I'm gonna allow uh, the next person to speak. Thanks, Elizabeth. Alex, you can. I can unmute. Yes. I want to go back to almost the beginning when somebody was asking about uh, rents. That was very Sorry, early on. I'm just interrupt quickly. Can you just introduce yourself? Oh, yes. My name is Alex Hoare. I live at 42 Cottage Street. And I want Thanks. to go back to. Uh, um, a very early question that was being asked about affordable housing, what were the rents, uh, incomes, and all that kind of stuff. After the plan was put out and we were writing comments on it, I went down to University Drive and looked at 70, 70 University Drive. And I looked at housing down there. It's set back off of University Drive. Doesn't, it's not in anybody's face. And I drove in and inquired how much rent was. 70 Main Street has affordable housing. A one bedroom, and I may be off a little bit on these numbers because this is from memory, but a one bedroom was $2,400 a month. Mm -mm -mm. That's $28,800 a year. A two bedroom was $2,800 a month. That's $33,600 a year. Those are New York City prices. My son has an apartment in Brooklyn. He pays $1,900 a month. It's, it's, it, it's, it's expensive to rent in Amherst. And when we had a conversation with a major developer in town, when we asked them to put affordable housing in and he's locked into a certain price, what he does is he increases the rent in the other units to subsidize the affordable housing, which is why they come in and ask for an extra floor. And that may be a variance and then the variance has been, you know, can be granted by the town. So the affordable housing that you ask for is subsidized by those units that are not affordable housing. And as I just said from the prices, they're expensive. So if we're gonna have in next to Cottage Street, dense housing, um, I, I, I am one to say, I would rather see downtown vibrant business for everybody in town rather than developing Amherst as adjunct to the, the campus and essentially subsidizing 
the housing for the university by changing our downtown into a dense housing unit. I think there are other places, when I just mentioned one, where it can fit in very nicely. And I, uh, for one, really don't want to see downtown turned into um, a residential center. Thank you. Thanks, when you were Alex. talking about the one bedroom uh, for $2,400, that was the market price? I yeah, assume, because it's not the, it wouldn't be the affordable price by a long No, time. it wouldn't. No, I, I, yeah. I, I disabled this um, talking. But yeah, no, that would be the um, market. The market. I did, when um, I did hear that the affordable units, right, are, um, and, and those units, I think, are less than half the price of the market rate. So there is a big... Yeah. you know, discrepancy in the rental amounts between the affordable and the market rate. Um, Nate, Nate, I see a number of people whose hands are raised who have spoken already, but I also see a number of people who haven't spoken. So maybe we should choose the people who haven't spoken because yep. we're approaching um, a quarter of nine and maybe nine o'clock should be our cutoff. Um, sure. Yeah, we have seven hands raised right now. So I, I think um, I'll just go down and write, choose who hasn't spoken. So Ira, um, you can unmute yourself. Okay. Hi, my name is Ira Brick. I live on Strong Street. And just uh, some quick comments. I appreciate some of the design elements that you added into that, uh, I understand, diagram that people would embellish. Um, I do think that that does limit people to providing better aesthetics than the five-story buildings. I also agree with everybody that has said, and I have said for a long time, five stories is way too tall for the scale of downtown. It's a short downtown. I, when I'm in a town like uh, Evanston, Illinois, larger than us, a college-based town, and I think, why does five stories look okay here? The streets are much wider, they're longer. This just looks like you're creating a big canyon. And I just want to point out that in your PowerPoint on page 51, where you give examples of how facades could look using your design elements, most of those are four stories, your examples. And um, also the question of form-based, which I've done some reading about, but even in your materials, form-based is described as having a relationship to the street, architectural character, community context, town character. I think that some of the buildings that are in your presentation of examples of four stories are much too modern. If you have uh, one of each of those downtown, it's really going to look quite um, motley, in my opinion. I, I would aim more towards New England. Um, the last thing is, I know there's been a lot of discussion with the five-story buildings that basically are private dormitories, that you can't mandate use that anybody could move in there, and yet they're designed for student life. They're four-bedroom uh, apartments rented by the room. I have a four-bedroom house where I raised my family. I did not rent by the room to my family members. And I don't know how you get it so that they are designed and marketed towards the young families and the young professionals or the retirees that we say we want and to not have people skirt all of what we're trying to do to just make different looking dorms. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. All right, uh, Robert Greeny, you're about to speak. Hi, I'm Robert Greeny. I live on Clawland Street. And um, in the interest of time, I just want to go on the public rec record as affirming very strongly all the comments unanimously that have been made tonight. Every single one of them is, I agree with. From Jennifer talking about the buildings being too high, right down to Ira talking about five stories being too big. What I want to add to that is that the um, even when you have rules, the rules have to be enforced. 
and the uh, adjudicating agency or the enforcement agency is the planning board. And those of us that have been following recent town um, happenings around the planning board have no confidence, zero confidence that the planning board will represent the interests of the people that have spoken tonight. Uh, except with one exception, I don't think there's anyone on the planning board that um, would reflect and represent these opinions. So if we're gonna have any confidence that whatever we do is carried out in the interests of all the people of the town, we need to have a planning board that is populated by the diversity of opinions and people in this town. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Uh, see, uh, John, you can unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, this is John Page, 683 East Pleasant Street. Uh, speaking as a resident, as an individual, um, I'm kind of surprised by the opposition to this proposal. Best case scenario, we have more housing units, more affordable units, more prescriptive design guidelines, including green space, and potentially state bonuses for bringing in families with school-aged children. Worst case scenario, the status quo. So why not adopt this? People have talked about shade, configuration of units, exactly who will live there? If I was housing insecure, or homeless, or had children who wanted to go to school here in Amherst, I'd be worried about a home. In my personal opinion, the phrases protecting neighborhoods, character of town, are dog whistling and inherently have a certain racial undertones. I've also heard talking about places for private vehicles, but not about places for people. Which, by the way, if you're talking about the destination Amherst proposal, that's about privately developing a parking garage. Why do we care about cars and not humans? I'm caring about people. We're talking about aesthetics. I'd like to talk about lives and livelihoods. Those of us who live in Amherst cannot raise a drawbridge and never allow anyone to enjoy the privilege we have of living in the beautiful community we call Amherst. You all raise how high Amherst prices are. The solution, part of it, is this. This is a public policy tool to achieve all of our goals. And as I've said before, I ask people to say yes and to question how, not if. I would like to see Amherst and Amherst, where we welcome all people, like we, like we say we do, that wants people to live here, where we bring people more into the fold. 40 hours of strategy, a technical one, a multi-year one at this point, to do that via zoning policy. And I hope we start with downtown. And then we use it in East Amherst, Pomeroy Village and beyond. Thank you. All right, uh, Jack, um, you can unmute yourself. How you doing? Um, Jack Chemsek, 76 Mount Holyoke Drive. I'm on the planning board. And um, what an interesting um, evening it's been. Uh, I learned you know, much more by viewing this presentation, uh, this revised presentation. <clears throat> but um, kind of taken aback by the comments, but I, I guess at this hour, I'm not going to get into it, but it, I do, I, I'm, I'm offended by some of the comments with regard to um, the players. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that John Page spoke before me. So I am not, <laughs> I'm not gonna get into that, but what I was, um, the majority of the folks that have spoken tonight have 
offered some consistency perhaps in their opinions, but we started off with, with John Hornick and Rob Crowner, who are two very respected folks that have contributed a lot. And um, for one, I, I kind of wanted Rob Crowner to, to develop a little bit more um, because I really respect his opinion um, with regard to the, you know, how the 40R uh, fits. But um, I do, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little taken aback, you know, the, the dorm statement for downtown has been addressed by folks in town council. I wish that would not be used because it's, it, it is, um, it's inaccurate and offensive uh, to the people that live uh, in the buildings. And, um, you know, I'm sorry, one person spoke that had that zero confidence in the planning board. Uh, I, I feel we have one of the best planning boards uh, that we've had in a very long time. Um, uh, but at this point, I'm going to be quiet because I know it's approaching nine. <laughs> Thank you for letting me speak. But I would like to hear some closing statements by John Hornick and Rob Crowner based on all the comments that we've gotten. Because I'm, I'm a little bit different place with regard to the 40R proposal for downtown than I was six months ago. Thank you. Right. Um, uh, Winifred Manning, you can speak. Um, yes, I live on 61 Fearing Street. Um, I in very, um, <clears throat> this, what I have to say is really something that's more of a detail, but due to the two people who just spoke, I'm, I'm just very sorry to hear that they're taking all of the comments in such a negative way. I've really learned a lot of, and heard a lot of very interesting suggestions and all that, and I haven't taken them that way at all. But uh, one thing I do, uh, living very close to Uptown, and it's, uh, there's a lot of talk about the, um, the physical design of the outside of the buildings. And I think there's one thing that's very, very important, and that is the infrastructure, the things like the sound the sounds that uh, large building developments um, impact the town with, HVAC systems, a lot of extra lighting. You know, so many developers think everything has to be completely lit. And I, I'm thinking of the people who now live on, on Cottage Street and um, how that would change their view and their their neighborhoods so i think those are things that, that should be thought about and i know that's a detail and we're talking big issues but that is something that i think should be woven into the plans and the restrictions that might go along with some of that so thank you very much for all the information that has been shared tonight and the chance to hear that thank you just a really quick note in the design standards, there are requirements for HVAC systems. There are requirements for lighting um, to control exactly what you're talking about. Are they strong enough? Are they robust enough? I mean, we could certainly talk about that, but in efforts being made to address those issues, they're really important issues. I know that there's a building up at the end of our street that over the years has, you know, I walk by it and I think, oh my God, if I lived beside that, it would drive me crazy because all summer the air conditioning conditioning is going outside. And I think that is something that's really important in any neighborhood. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, we have um, two more. Allison, you can um, unmute yourself. Sure. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Allison Ozer. I live on Middle Street, actually, in South Amherst. Um, but I've been, um, I'm a retiree in a sense. I've lived in Amherst a long time, and I've been, for the last few years, actually trying to explore whether I can afford to stay in Amherst and where I might want to be. And 
I grew up in the city, I've been attracted to living perhaps in town. And what I've noticed in terms of the development is, as many people have said, a lot of the development lands up being um, apartments or housing for more affordable for students with rents and prices that are almost geared to either um, two income, I'm a single person, two income families or multiple students so that they can afford higher rents or higher costs. There's been very little um, that has been very appealing towards actually even staying in Amherst. So I'm sort of excited to hear more about this and actually disappointed to hear more about this because I do, as many of the people uh, have been saying, feel that four even, or but certainly five story buildings will change the character, um, the light, the openness, the feel of the town. And I think um, part of that is the draw to living here, to feeling sort of a sense of, of size um, that is different than being in a city, a sense of town instead of a city street. Um, the other part is the, the density um, where I think, you know, personally, I think maybe having housing that's affordable more towards the edges or in other areas might be more welcoming, especially also if there's some more open space. And this I, I'm thinking of in terms of families, as some people have mentioned. Um, I'm not exactly sure that um, those who might not qualify for low income, affordable um, apartments or units that they might buy would actually be able to afford the ones that are not, um, and that would be me included, but also that the design would not necessarily be all that appealing um, towards a sense of home um, for either families or even older persons like myself who want a sense of community rather than just sort of being in something that might feel more like a, a dorm in town, um, whether it has students or not. Um, so I just wanted to say that um, I, I, this is my first time hearing about the plan. I think it's interesting and I really appreciate the efforts made to try and have setbacks and open up space and that there's a lot of room for design changes. But I think even just the notion of self is sort of maybe missing um, some response of this to other needs that exist in this town. And um, so I just want to say that I think there's a need almost for more, perhaps even I live in South Amherst, like around Palmer, I've thought about that North Amherst, um, affordable, but housing, but affordable also for people who don't quite qualify for low income. So that's something I want to put out. Thanks. All right, we have two uh, more hands raised. Um, uh, Cinda, you're allowed to speak. Good evening. Thanks for doing this. Um, I'd like to see this happen. I live downtown at 232 Amity. Um, my name is Cinda Jones. And um, I appreciate how downtown has traditionally been built to advantage public green space. And, and that's what a downtown is. You have the commons and Kendrick Place, and you have pretty good sized sidewalks at East Pleasant Street, uh, one East Pleasant Street. And, um, and you have the benefit of the public green space. Um, I think a lot of green space other than that downtown um, isn't smart growth so much. And I guess that's why I like North Amherst and we have a park too and, and trails that go through town to South Amherst. So um, it's a different kind of housing. You can choose to live in the woods or you can choose to live downtown. It's two different choices and it's not for everybody, but I think it's attractive for many. Um, if I were to try to rebuild my grandfather's 1950s one story building on 29 Cottage Street and try to do something better than what it is now and it, it's kind of like Puffton Village. It wasn't meant to last this long. How could I think, could I, am I somebody who could figure out 40R or is this more for Beacon or a major company who understands paperwork and promises and 
reporting. It intimidates me. And I would like to think I'm smart enough to do it, but I, I, I keep doubting that. So um, that's my question. Would either Karen or David like to answer that? Yeah, it's a really good question. These requirements are not meant to be onerous because it's not in the state's interest to make them onerous. However, they're pretty tight because they demand accountability. I mean, Karen, what do you think? Could a small developer, I mean, bringing in necessary consultants, um, you know, make all of this work with 20-25% with, with affordable housing uh, without being a uh, Beacon Communities or a large development company. I mean, my, perce my perception is yes, you can hire people to do it. Karen, would you, do you think, would you agree? You know, this has been an issue for a while in the community. Um, uh, going back when we were doing the um, housing production plan, it came up and it came up also in the interview process um, for this particular project. Um, typically, to do the necessary marketing um, and follow the requirements for the affordable use units, the best thing to do is to hire the expertise. And there are individual consultants that can do that for small scale projects. And then there are other uh, nonprofits that have capacity to do it for larger projects. Um, it is a huge issue. It is an expense and um, it, you know, it will be included, would be included in the building development costs. And um, it, it is a requirement um, for in the 40R district based on state. Um, regulations. As architects, we did a 20 unit development uh, mixed income um, in Medford and in Beverly, we did a 28 unit mixed income development. These are relatively small. They had affordable components and the developers hired the consultants to, right. uh, to do the work that needed to be done. Right. And I don't think 40R makes it much more complicated than that. No, it's the same affordability requirements. The state, same state requirements have to be met. All right, thanks, Cinda. The, um, Barbara, you're the last uh, one with the hand raised. Barbara needs to unmute herself. Yeah, you, you spoke earlier, Barbara. Maybe you, I thought you raised your hand again. Or maybe you didn't. I did, but it's Celia. It's not Barbara. Oh, sorry. And yeah, sorry. I'm, you're on I'm, Barbara's computer. I'm on Barbara's computer. Um, I'll, I'll pass. <laughs> oh, okay. To um, Rob Crowner or John Hornick wish to make some closing statements as uh, Jack Jemsick suggested. Yeah, I, I, I would. Um, Thanks, Jack. I know how difficult it is to, to actually serve on the planning board. Um, and I, but I, I did find most of the comments uh, interesting and, and helpful. Um, I, I would say that a lot of people seem to think that this is a plan. It's not really a plan. It's, it's describing how, um, how we want the downtown to look, what the, where the downtown is, uh, how it how it moves from one part of, of uh, the town center to another, um, and so so we're describing uh, um, an ideal, and the the existing zoning that I admit that I was a part of of pushing and implementing didn't always work the way we thought it was going to work, and 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 so we need to learn from our mistakes. We need to make them better. This, I think, um, is a step in that direction. It, it, it recognizes the problems with the setback, recognizes the problems with the height of buildings, and it says, this is a better way of doing it. Um, so um, as I think one of the commentators, Elizabeth said, we wanna find a way, if we, if we just, if we leave the existing zoning as it is, we're going to be stuck with the existing zoning and that's what people are going to choose possibly. I think we need to find a way of, um, of 
changing the existing zoning so that so that this is so that a 40R um, choice is a better choice for for all of the downtown, um, not just the center, but also the the uh, the uh, neighborhood areas. Um, and uh, um, people have have made suggestions uh, for ways that this could be improved, and I think I think we should take a look at those and 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 try and, and get there. But we're not what we have now is is not ideal. People have uh, clearly said this is not ideal. Um, is is it the, is is it not the case that 40R would be a better situation than what we have now? I think it would be. So let's let's try and figure out a way to make it work. I'll just add a brief comment, Chris. Um, in my earlier remarks, I mentioned the minefield of zoning in Amherst, and my appreciation for Karen and David and trying to walk that minefield. I think what we've heard tonight is really an illustration of the fact that this really is a minefield. It's very difficult to navigate, very difficult to negotiate, and in part because people say, well, here's what's important to me, and actually I'm not willing to give that up. And when you add up all the things that people are not willing to give up, then it becomes impossible to do any rezoning, whether it's 40R or anything else that you can imagine. As David said a number of times, there are trade-offs. You have to kind of strive for a balance. And what I wish I'd heard more of is I'd be willing to give A up if I could be assured of B. But mostly what I was hearing was, this is really important to me. I really like downtown the way it is. I really just can't stand the idea of another five-story building and so on. And so uh, I really feel that it's gonna be very difficult, whether it's the planning board or town council to move ahead with changes that in fact will improve things both in downtown Amherst and elsewhere, and particularly to enable us to expand affordable housing. So thank you. Well, um, I would just like to say thank you to everybody for attending tonight. This was a really great discussion. Um, we had good presentations by David and Karen that went far beyond what they had presented earlier and um, lots of very um, heartfelt um, comments and questions from our attendees. And um, we will take this under advisement and um, work with Karen and David to come up with a, a final report and project. Um, and then we'll see where we want to go from here. Um, you have any, Karen and David, do you have any further comments or Nate? No, I just want to thank everybody for participating. You know, thank you very, very much for the comments. And just one quick comment on what John said. Maybe there are fewer minds out there than are imagined. Um, everybody needs to think, including us, what will likely, what could blow up and be horrible and what may be is not so likely to be the landmine we imagine it to be. And I don't want to suggest that any of these issues are really important issues to think about. And we're certainly going to think about them. Yeah, no, I, I took good notes. I can get those to everyone, um, the consultants. And I, I think everyone, I also think, you know, to Rob Crowner's point, you know, I think zoning is, you know, um, challenging and it's kind of esoteric, but I, you know, I think now, I mean, I, my, I like to think that we can change it. So, you know, we could try something and if it doesn't work, we can always change it. So even if we adopt a 40R as a community and then we want to change it, we could do that. So, you know, I, you know, I, I sometimes feel like we think it's set in stone and it is a difficult process to get it pr approved or changed, but I like to think that we, you know, as a community, um, we can make the changes we want to see. So, um, you know, I don't know exactly what that means, but I think, you know, I'd like to think that we could try something and, and adapt it if, if it's not working. So, you know, right. I'm confident that there's- We'll be in touch. Thank yeah. you, everybody.
Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So I'm going to end the meeting for everyone. I'm going to stop sharing the screen and then I'll just uh, end the meeting. So. And I guess I need to stop recording, right? Oh, uh, yeah. I don't. Yeah. Thank you.